things. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I'll read it one more time since it's so short. For as many of you as have been baptized. Everyone say, been baptized. Into Christ. So when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. So uh, another way you could say it, we know that baptismal formula of the New Testament church was in the name of Jesus Christ. They said some sort of version of that, if you will, but it was always had the name Jesus involved when it says in the name. You can also put into the name because that's where you're being immersed into salvation, which is what Jesus means. And so in the name, it's into the name and uh, the New Testament Epistles confirm this because every time it talks about being baptized, it talks about being baptized into Christ. And so if everyone that's been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ has been baptized into Christ. And what that means here, Paul says, we've put on Christ. And so with that, I want to talk about something tonight that I'll title, Put on the Lord Jesus. Look at somebody and tell them, Put on the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us through his word today and strengthen us. Father, we love you. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather. I ask, Lord, that every person that's here tonight that hears this word, that it would confirm our faith, that it would stretch our faith, that it would challenge us to be who you want us to be, and that we would leave here edified through your word and the gathering together of your people. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um. The, the foundational message of the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what Paul says. We didn't come to you with man's wisdom and fancy words. We came to you in the power and demonstration of the Spirit uh, and through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said to the Corinthian church, I don't know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's my message uh, because that message is the answer to anything. Everyone's got a different problem, but it's still Jesus that's the answer to every problem. Amen? And so, uh, with the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, though, we see uh, meticulously recorded in the book of Acts is that the hearer is uh, expected to give a response in the sense of, what are you going to do with what you've heard? We just preached to you about Jesus. Preached to you about his life, his death, his burial, resurrection, what that means, who he is, what he did. What does that mean for you? And we see many, many people experiencing through obedient action to the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're experiencing what I, what we call the new birth, and this new birth, this born again experience, if you will, is found in what Jesus is telling Nicodemus in John three: we've got to be born again of the water and spirit, or we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we see that this water and spirit birth involves water baptism and spirit baptism. And we see it played out through the book of Acts and talked about more in the epistles and, and all of that. So this new birth involves water and spirit. And in Romans 6, we find Paul talking to the church in Rome. And he says in Romans 6 verse 3, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, um, we see then here that 
this involves a death, a burial, and a resurrection, which is what Jesus experienced, did, died, was buried, rose again. And Paul says we identify with this through baptism. Um, verse 3, for so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Why was, I'm just going to, why was Jesus buried? Because he died. Why must we be buried? Because we died. What is that? We repented. We did what Jesus said. We denied ourselves. We relinquished ownership of our life. We uh, denied ourselves. We took up our cross. Denying ourselves and taking up our cross, that's identifying with the death of Jesus Christ. And so then, what do you do when someone dies? You bury them. And, uh, but this, Jesus was buried. We identify with his burial and water baptism. But we're also cement, meant to identify with his resurrection which brings about then this spirit baptism that Jesus talks about in John 3 that's portrayed all throughout the book of Acts, all of that. We are to identify with the full uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Luke chapter 24 gives us some insight into this next stage, if you will, of this. Luke chapter 24 And it starts at verse 46. It says, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now we find in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 that Jesus uh, makes a powerful statement uh, to his disciples right before his resurrection, uh, his ascension. And he says in verse 5 of Acts 1, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Not many days from now, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So we see here, water baptism is this immersion and this burial with Christ. And uh, when you are buried in the name of Jesus. It's like you're put into Christ, if you will, the body of Christ, the church, of course. And then we see this other element of the new birth, spirit baptism, where uh, Jesus says in verse 5 of Acts 1, you shall, um, or I'm sorry, Luke 24, he says, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And that word endued means clothed clothed. Uh, So we see here that when we talk about for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, it's talking about the whole thing. It's talking about the whole thing. Uh, Being water baptized into Jesus Christ, it's where the blood is, is applied because Hebrews says without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And Peter says to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so then we see you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because it is a promise. This gift is a promise. And when you receive it, you are clothed in it. It, it, It's something that is in you and it's on you. That's what the Holy Ghost is meant to be. It's this comforter, the helper, the spirit of God that is meant to clothe you, which means it affects every part of you inwardly and outwardly. 
And so with this understanding in mind, we put on Jesus through the new birth. We do. We put on Jesus through the new birth. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Notice in John 3, Jesus didn't distinguish uh, a difference between what we would call uh, uh, the new birth. We must be born again of water and spirit or we cannot enter. He didn't say one or the other. Water and spirit or we cannot enter. We need that both. We need to obey fully what we find in Scripture, and it's part of putting on the Lord Jesus. Now, what's interesting about this resurrection power this uh, that Jesus uh, portrayed and we read about with his resurrection, how he came out of the tomb and the high priest sought to, or, uh, to uh, seal the tomb and make sure that no one could tamper with it from the outside. But they uh, weren't counting on anyone tampering with it from the inside. And so uh, there's Roman guards all around the tomb. And it's sealed. And it's meant to uh, stay the way it is. But yet, when it's time for Jesus to rise again, there were eyewitnesses of that moment. There were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection at the tomb. And then there was eyewitnesses that Jesus had rose again after he came out of the tomb. Yeah, there were eyewitnesses at his resurrection, of his resurrection, and there were eyewitnesses after his resurrection that he was resurrected. Well, why can't the same be said of us? Eyewitnesses of our resurrection, and then eyewitnesses of the proof that we've been resurrected. That's how it's supposed to be. Eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And then Acts 1, Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. There needs to be eyewitnesses of our resurrection. And then we need to show ourselves alive afterwards by many infallible proofs. There's a change in that person. And they see it at work. What's the change? I've been resurrected. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, how can I say this? Because the book of Acts talks about it. Every time someone was born again of water and spirit, they were eyewitnesses at the moment they were resurrected. They identified with the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they were raised to life. Uh, over and over and over again. And we see and know that the common, uh, consistent example of that experience was they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 8, 10, 19, uh, just to name a few. And with that in mind, there were eyewitnesses at the moment. And then afterwards, the people in the cities and even personal examples of what's different about those people well they're living in newness of life they're walking in newness of life so newness of life is meant to be an experience yes and it's also meant to be a walk We love the experience of Sunday. Every Sunday you can, and, and I, I hate to use this as an example, but it's kind of like the starting point, so we all should be able to identify with it. But Sundays are meant to be an opportunity for us to experience newness of life, but also for people to come in who've never experienced it, to experience it for the first time. And us who have experienced it and are supposed to be walking in it, it's an opportunity for us to experience uh, the worship and the preaching and the spirit of God and and all of that together that happens when we all come together. It's meant to be an edification. That's part of the reason why we assemble. We're supposed to be edified. But we're not supposed to only be edified in our emotions. I I was sad when I came to church and I left happy. I mean, you, you, you can take a picnic lunch and go on the coast and be there sad and then leave happy. Okay? Let's not dumb down the power of Jesus to just emotion. Uh, Yes, our praise is emotional. 
It's not only emotional, but it is emotional because God gave us emotions. And I think the most noble way to use our emotions is in worship to God. If we can get bent out of shape with our emotions over problems and situations and how people treated us, surely we can get bent back into shape by praising Jesus and getting a little emotional about when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all. Yeah. So anyway, that's a whole other subject, sorry. The point is, is, we like the experience of newness of life. We love when the Holy Ghost moves. When the presence of God inhabits our praise, we leave strengthened and encouraged in a church service. You and I should and can experience that every day in our time alone with Jesus personally. We should, we can, we should every day because that's part of the walk. But then the other part of the walk is allowing that spirit of God in us to change the way we live, that how we live on the other side of newness of life proves the fact I'm alive. I'm not talking about physically, I'm alive spiritually. What's that proof? It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And so you and I, though, really can't have the fruit of the Spirit being produced in our life if we're not full of the spirit it's impossible and um, so with that in mind there's a newness of life experience and then we're to walk in newness of life for what Paul says in Romans 6 one more time I read it know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The likeness of his resurrection. That's why Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. We should be living a resurrected life after we've been filled with the Holy Ghost. We should be living a resurrected life. What does that look like? Not controlled by dead works. Not controlled by the wages of sin. Not controlled by the things that are associated with death, corruption. We're walking in our resurrected life. And death has no more dominion over us. That's the will of God for you. That is the will of God for us. Everyone say, put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus. There is a consistent concept communicated in the New Testament. In the epistles, after the Gospels, and the book of Acts. There's a common, consistent concept. And it is likened unto armor. And this armor is mentioned several times in the New Testament, in different places. But it's never called the same thing. But that's what we have to understand is we're not looking at it to be like, oh, it's different sets of armor because it's said it's different. You know, this is going to make sense in a moment. So why don't we turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and we'll read through it together. Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll start at verse 10. Paul is ending his letter to the church in Ephesus. And he is mentioning something that he's mentioned before. But he starts off in, in this segment of chapter 6 by saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, I've looked at that, and it's a command to be strong. 
in the Lord. But you and I can't be strong in the Lord by ourselves, Because if we could, we wouldn't need him. So we can't be strong in the Lord by ourselves, but he commands us to be strong. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he tells us what that means. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There's three things. Uh, We can call it triple P. Put on, pray, and persevere. Those are three things highlighted in this. You got to put on the armor, you got to pray, and you need to persevere. And so, by doing that, that's how we're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might we got to put on the armor of God. What is this armor? We'll come back to it in a minute, but let's go to Romans 13 real quick. Romans chapter 13, and uh, we'll start at verse 11. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Paul says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Now, in these two passages we've read, we've seen three different things were to put on. The armor of God, the armor of light, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we're thinking of it that way, like that's a lot to put on. But if you think of it a different way, it's all the same thing. And that's not us choosing how we want to view it. It's actually the truth. Paul talks about put on the armor of light in Romans 13. He talks about putting on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. And then at the end of Romans 13, he says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. There's no difference between the armor of God and the armor of light. It's the same armor. And there's no difference in any of it because Jesus is the armor. That's what we need to understand today. That's why it's real simple. We don't need to complicate it. We don't need to make this something that's uh, harder than it is or that it needs to be. Jesus is the armor. He is the armor. And so with that in mind, let's look at this for a second. Uh, Going back to Ephesians 6. I told told you this is real Bible study tonight. Flipping, going through chapters and verses, really breaking it down. Uh, Let's look through the pieces of this armor real quick that we're to put on. The first one is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Salvation. Now, what, what's interesting about this that I, I think we ought to consider is that this helmet of salvation, we need to look at this. How, how is Jesus the helmet of salvation? Well, one, Jesus is the Savior. Two, 
Jesus means uh, Yahweh has become my salvation. He is my salvation. And uh, this principle throughout the New Testament about having the mind of Christ, uh, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, how can you have the mind of Christ but not have the helmet of salvation? So by also considering this real quick, Titus chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What's that? The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Who appeared? What appeared? Jesus. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, this idea, you can't have the helmet of salvation without Jesus. Look at this, breastplate of righteousness. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 kind of gives us a little insight into this, as well as John in, in his letter, I believe 1 John. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 um, it says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. We already talked about how you get in Christ Jesus. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. Made un Jesus is wisdom and righteousness. Jesus is righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. He's our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If you've put on Jesus, you put on your breastplate because Jesus is the armor. Loins gird about with truth, the belt of truth, if you will. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth. You can't put on a different truth besides Jesus. This isn't 21st century philosophical mindset. You have your truth and my truth, and we all believe what we want to believe that's real to us, and it's all valid. That may be the case in certain things, but when it comes to Jesus, he's the truth, and he's the way, he's the life, and so to gird your loins with truth, it's Jesus. Uh, gospel shoes, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel in the New Testament, it's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. And Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. So when you've put on the your, your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's Jesus. Uh, the shield of faith wherewith we quench every fiery dart of the wicked. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 is very interesting. Uh, because there's something I think sometimes that we need to have a, a good reminder of. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Uh, how can Christ live in you unless your Holy Ghost filled? Christ living in me and the life which I now live. Talking about the newness of life. That walking in newness of life. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Paul's faith isn't mentioned anywhere in this verse. This new life he's now living, he's saying, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Meaning, our faith isn't enough. We put our faith in Jesus. We obey his word, yes. So our faith is involved, but this idea of of we can become good enough to be accepted in his sight, we can be righteous enough on our own, it doesn't matter what you master. It doesn't matter how good you become. It doesn't matter what sins you overcome, what temptations you resist, how much fruit of the Spirit you produce. You and I, we cannot take credit for any of it. If we have all the fruit of the Spirit just overflowing in our life, we can't say, I did that. Jesus did that. It's His Spirit in us. Amen. So this faith, when we put our faith in Jesus, it's kind of like he puts his faith in us. And what he knows we can become, we just get out of the way and let him make us into what he knows we can become. That's why when someone feels or or, or someone's told God wants to use you in this way or whatever, and they're like, oh, no, he, no. Get your faith out of the way and let his faith work in you. Because then we're controlling what Jesus can do in our life. And that's not how it's supposed to be. The shield of faith, when it's his faith, all the fiery darts of the wicked will be quenched. If it's our faith, we get to take credit. If it's our righteousness, we get to take credit. If it's our truth, we take credit. But if it's Jesus, my salvation, Jesus, my righteousness, Jesus, my truth, Jesus, my peace, Jesus, my shield, nobody can take credit. We just put him on and we pray and we persevere. Amen. There's one last piece that we're to pick up. It's the only weapon mentioned in this armor because it's the only weapon needed. It's called the sword of the spirit which is also Jesus. I'll prove it to you. The sword of the Spirit. Now here, this word is rhema. And uh, another word in the New Testament is also logos. But rhema, if I can describe it like this, it's, it's a specific word in the moment that comes from the logos, the forever settled word of God, if you will. It's a, it's a right now word. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but we get the example of it when uh, the devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness, and Jesus uses specific words from the word of God to combat that specific temptation. Okay, so, (laughs) you know, uh, you know, the, the devil tempts him. And he says, cast yourself down from here for it's written. You know, you'll give your angels charge over you. And Jesus uh, says, I believe if I remember correctly, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Um, And, you know, it's a right now word specific for that moment, which is why Jesus did not quote Genesis (laughs) 1-1. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not. But using the, the word of God specifically, there, there is a verse in this Bible to combat every temptation, every trial, every situation, every onslaught of the enemy. You just got to make sure you use the right one. That's where the rhema aspect of it. It's the sword of the spirit. And so Jesus is that though. John 1, the word was made flesh. And it was talking about Jesus. And I want to close tonight by reading one passage at the end of the book. That really can kind of give us some insight. And it's found in Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. The writer says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Well, you can't be true if you're not truth. Faithful and true. Hmm. And in righteousness 
he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that it, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Pop quiz. One question, pass or fail, who is this passage talking about? Jesus, yes, Jesus. It's Jesus that's coming back. It's Jesus, our peace, righteousness, salvation, truth, faith, shield. He is the word of God made flesh. He is God. He's our Savior. Put him on, and you'll overcome anything and everything. It, we got to put him on to be saved through the new birth. We talked about it. We got to put him on to walk in newness of life. It's a daily decision that I'm not going to take credit for my salvation by thinking that I'm doing enough to earn this. It doesn't matter how long. We've been in it. There's got to be this cog, uh, this conscious uh, awareness. I've got to rely on Jesus every day. And if we're going to withstand the enemy, it's because we put on Jesus. And Paul says we prayed. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. We need to be like Paul. He says, I pray with the understanding and I pray with the Spirit. Uh, because the Spirit maketh intercession for us. When we don't know what to pray for, it prays the perfect will of God. This awareness, this mindset of keeping Jesus uh, at the forefront and putting him on is we make sure we're making this decision daily to walk in this newness of life not going back to the beggarly elements of the world. And what does that mean? I'm closing. But we always think of the beggarly elements of the wor world as like certain sins. But there's this idea that summarizes all of it. Doing it my way. The idea of the self-made man. There's no self-made men in heaven. And so... The beggarly elements of the world, first and foremost, every sin that we think of is rooted in this idea of doing it on my own, doing it myself, doing it my way. That's what got us in this mess to begin with. Adam and Eve, I don't want to do it God's way. I want to do it my way. I want to eat of this fruit because this is what I want to do. That's how the next generation murder came about. So this idea of, well, I don't do these things, so I'm all right. No, no, no. Is there a continual reliance on Jesus or isn't there? Because the continual reliance on Jesus is this proof we're walking in newness of life. Because we can't produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life fully if we're not continually relying on Jesus. And this, this idea of, uh, you know, got this far and I'm saved and it's all good now. We've got to walk in newness of life. And there can never be a moment where we cross over from I'm saved, and, 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 and look, at, look at my life, look at all I've done. And we also cannot resist what Jesus seeks to do in our life 
to continue to form and fashion us into his image. I have a question. Are you in the grave? No, because you're here. Has Jesus come back yet? No. Because we're here, hopefully. That means he's not done with you. He's not done with you. Jesus isn't done with you. Let him have his way in your life and let him make you into who he knows you can be. Don't let your faith get in the way. Just put it in him and say, Jesus, take the wheel. Take over. Make me into who you want me to be. I'm done trying to do it on my own. The cross, that's part of the cross. Jesus didn't just die to get you into a church. No, no, no. He died to save you, to form you, to fashion you, to redeem you. The whole journey until one day we're with him in heaven. How many want Jesus to have his way in your life? Let's stand. Amen. Let's pray. Let's make a commitment to the Lord. We're going to walk in this newness of life by putting Jesus on. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for your word. God, I pray that you would help us to understand these truths tonight. I pray, God, that we would seek you in prayer daily. We would seek you through your word daily. That we would seek and allow the word to affect our life, to continually change our motives and our decisions. That in times of prayer, God, the Holy Ghost would fall on us. We'd pray in the Spirit. We'd pray with our own understanding and our own language. But God, I pray that there would be a deep work of your Spirit in our lives as we commune with you daily, as we meditate on your law day and night. And I pray, God, that you would put the mind of Christ in each of us, Lord, that we would think the way you want us to think, that our heart, oh God, would be a new heart, not filled with the things of the old man but filled with the things of the new man that we would desire the things you desire that we would have motives Lord God that are inspired by your will O God and I pray Lord Jesus help us to walk closely with you putting all our faith in you so that you and your faith through us can make us into who we want who you want us to be O Lord I pray strengthen your people tonight I pray, edify your people tonight and help us to walk in this newness of life like never before we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.